Okay. Well, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to see uh, as many of you as there are here. <laughs> it's always a light turnout. I'm always amazed at uh, how indifferent Latter-day Saints are to this information when it can make such a tremendous difference to uh, their gospel understanding of their testimony and all the rest. So it, it always surprises me. I, I guess it shouldn't, but it continually does. Um, anyway, welcome. Thanks for coming out. I, I hope I can uh, uh, fulfill your uh, expectations. I think we're going to be talking about a subject today that uh, most of us will find pretty fascinating. Uh, I know I do, but then I'm rather the exception rather than the rule. Um, I'm always I'm always amazed that. Uh, at the interest that we're seeing on the internet now uh, with, the, with the Facebook page. Um, it wasn't my initiative. Uh, um, uh, trying to think of the fellow's name that set it up. Marco. Guerrero, thank yeah. you. And uh, Marco did an excellent job. It was, he set it all up uh, very professionally and it looks good and it works well. And uh, I didn't know what to think of it, but it, but it immediately took off. And, we're up to, I think, about 1,500 members, mm -hmm. aren't we? Something about like 1,500, that? and it consistently grows. Yeah. Sometimes it spurts more than others right now, but it does consistently grow. Yeah. And uh, I need to thank Steve for, Stephen, for taking this, uh, putting all this together. He kind of my right-hand man. There are a lot of people I need to thank for uh, the support they give me, uh, like Marco and, and uh, like uh, Eric Poulin, who's just put up a new website for me that really looks nice. Eric's done a great job. So, and then there are way too many to na name, but you know who you are. So, thank you for your help and your support. I I, I am impressed because this um, you may or may not know that my books were LDS bestsellers for a full decade back in the late 80s and early 90s, and then. Um, well, I'm not really sure why, but the sales took a serious dip um, if in a space of about a year. Uh, they dropped to half of what they'd been before, and the next year they dropped half again, and pretty soon there were just a trickle going out the door. I rather suspect it's because someone at Deseret Book uh, decided to uh, put the books on the shelf. They had newer titles. And so they decided to put the books on the shelf, spine out, instead of displaying them uh, uh, face cover. out. And of course, because that mine was a trilogy, I got lots more space on the bookshelf, and 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 that led to a lot of sales. I, 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 I in my, I don't know, naivete and vanity, I was hoping that I was making a difference. Uh, that in time, uh, most. There would be a large enough percentage of Latter-day Saints who would have read my books and uh, understood what I was trying to communicate enough to uh, kind of snowball and take the rest of the church in that direction. Because I think it's that important. Uh, this is, I'm absolutely convinced, information that Joseph Smith shared. There's plenty of uh, uh, documentary evidence, and we'll talk about some of that today, some of it quite powerful. And then there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that uh, uh, points to the fact that Joseph taught these things. Uh, that's why I titled it uh, uh, my web page and the uh, Facebook page, The Restored Gospel, um, Ancient Planetary History, and Cutting Edge Science, because those are the three legs of the stool that the thesis stands on, which is uh, very important from a scriptural point of view. Uh, two or three witnesses, every all truth is established. Uh, but in, in anyone's uh, world, scholastic, religious, otherwise, that kind of, uh, of a foundation uh, is hard to come by in any discipline. So um, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little time to begin with because this is videoed to uh, shamelessly uh, <laughs> plug my classes because 
because that's where the information really lies. Uh, it's called uh, the ancient, forgive my writing, I'm trying to improve my blackboard etiquette, but it's not making great leaps. Skies. And of course, the restored gospel. I called it that for obvious reasons. So much of the symbolism that the prophets used derived from what they what had been seen in the skies in the days of Adam, in what we know as a patriarchal age. And that became the, uh, did I spell gospel right? Yeah, thank you. I, I'm becoming more dyslexic as I age. I don't know why that is. It just, it just happens. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's uh, really 16 hours of instruction uh, and the reason it's so much is because we today have been given a distorted view of what ancient history was really about. Uh, we are not educated at all in the things that our ancestors knew well. And the prophets used that language. They were compelled to use that symbolic language that was based in what, they, what had been seen in the ancient skies because that was the street language. That's the way people understood their traditions. Just like it, uh, when we try to celebrate Christmas today and call it something else, Kwanzaa or whatever, uh, it, it just doesn't ring true, you know. But everybody knows the story of Santa Claus and Christmas trees and Jingle Bells and Rudolph the... We, we know that. It's part of our culture. This information was equally well known by the ancients. And we have no concept of that today. And, and therefore, when we read their writings that are steeped in this symbolism, when we read their writings, what they say makes no sense to us. Um, a, a good example would be uh, Beowulf. Have you ever tried to read Beowulf in the old original Old English? Boy, it, it, it's difficult, you know? And it's only been, what, 300, 400 years since Beowulf was penned? And it shows you how much our language has changed. Can you imagine how, how our understanding of this symbolism has changed in the last two or 3,000 years, you see? Um, the last people before Joseph Smith, the last people to employ this language were Christ's apostles. And the reason they did that, like I said, is because they were compelled to use that language. It was the common denominator in ancient culture. It didn't matter whether you were Egyptian or Jewish or Babylonian or Sumerian or Roman or Greek. Uh, all of those cultures understood the symbolism that was based in these ancient skies. So the prophets were faced with a, a very difficult problem. Actually, it wasn't difficult for them. It was difficult for us. For them, it was a natural thing to do. So that's why, the, that's why I use this. Um, it's not 16 hours in one fell swoop. They're each uh, one-hour classes. Um, uh, and I do charge for them, uh, and not because so I, I can make money. I don't mind making money. It's a, the coin of the realm is kind of important to our daily lives, but that's not what I do for income. I do it mostly to defray the expense of trying to keep this stuff in the public eye, keep it online, um, whatever. So, uh, and then I also, I'll, another of the main reasons that I charge is because <coughs> there are so many detractors who want to belittle this point of view for a variety of reasons. Some see it as demonic. Uh, some see it as apostate. Some see it as superfluous. Um, uh, of course, I see it none of those ways. But the, the point is that uh, if I'm charging for it, those people won't pay a dime to watch it. 
Therefore, I don't have to deal with their antagonism and their criticism. I get enough of that as it is. Those of you who try to share these concepts know what I'm talking about. So uh, that's part of the reason I charge. And I felt like five bucks an hour, uh, for an hour instruction was a little too little. I felt like $10 is all right, especially when you look at what you pay for an hour of instruction in a college course today. If you break it down, you're paying three or four times that much, maybe more, depending on the institution that you're going to. So that's my shameless plug for the classes. I'll add just a little bit. His revelation classes, um, you ought to take afterwards, which doesn't go over all revelations, but probably 80 or 90%. Of the it, book, it, of the, yeah, the yeah. book of Revelation. Yeah, the book of Revelation. It's, it's very good. Thanks. And uh, and I strongly suggest that, that one take the first 16 hours first in order to get this basis in ancient symbolism. You have to know where it comes from. And then you can take the 11 hour course on the book of Revelation where I go through it two hours, uh, two chapters at a time for one hour, uh, uh, explaining how John used this symbolism. And it becomes obvious then, oh, the mystery goes away. You know, the beasts, the, the horsemen, the uh, uh, 666, all of that stuff, all the mystique that's been built up in <coughs> Christian theology over that stuff just goes away. And, and it becomes, and this is the guarantee. And any of you ta who've taken the class, this is the guarantee that I make. This is the guarantee. If you'll take the 16 hours of instruction and hopefully the book of Revelation afterwards, but at least the very 16 hours, you'll then be able to pick up any book in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, or, or, or even the Book of Mormon, which is loaded with this symbolism, although it's more straightforward than the other texts which was typical of the Nephite prophets. You'll be able to pick those up and read them as easily as you read a morning newspaper or a magazine article. It's just that easy. This is the key. And, and part of the evidence for that is that it, it not only helps with our scriptures, it also illuminates our temple rituals, sorry. We don't like to we don't like to call the endowment a ritual, but it is. It's a 98% ritual, 2% um, uh, covenant. The covenant's easy to understand. I tell people, gee, you could go to the temple, you could take out your covenants and leave in 15 minutes. The rest of it is ritual, and we don't understand that. We 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 see the Genesis story as a, a literal story. It's a parable. Not only is the temple a parable, the scriptures are a parable. And, and again, this kind of coincidence or correspondence could not happen if this was just somebody's idea, uh, personal interpretation of prophecy. You can't go to... Um, Who's, who's a popular Christian minister today talking about prophecy? Give me a name. Nobody knows. Uh, Hagee is one. Does that ring a bell? Okay, Hagee is one. He's a big one. Uh, um, whatever he says about prophecy in the scriptures has absolutely no application to our temple rituals. It, 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 does, it casts no light on what we do at the t in the temple. This, this idea here absolutely illuminates our temple rituals. Everything you see, everything you say, everything you do, everything you hear, everything you wear goes to this business here. That's why it looks unfamiliar. And so instead of having uh, the brethren having um, seminars on how to stay awake in a temple session, um, uh, you're, you're riveted because you're understanding this story for the first time when you go through the temple. Once you take the classes, it's that simple. Um, and of course, what I wanted to put here was, you can understand Joseph Smith. 
can't spell tonight for some reason. Nothing looks right to me. Not only can you understand some of the more arcane references that Joseph Smith makes, you can you begin to discover that he understood this stuff as well. That's why he could that's why he could take the Egyptian documents and explain what they meant. And by the way, the critics are dead wrong. They're the ignoramuses. It is not Joseph Smith. They are the pretenders, not Joseph Smith. They are the frauds, not Joseph Smith. I don't care how many degrees they have. Joseph Smith nailed it. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Amen. Dude. So, so what happens? Your testimony shoots up. I've had people take my classes and say, well, I was just about to leave the church because none of it was making sense and I wasn't even sure Joseph Smith was a prophet anymore. After taking the classes, I can see that how wrong I was, number one, and number two, I can see why I need to remain faithful to the church. So anybody that's concerned about these lessons being um, apostate or anti-Mormon, you can put those concerns away. This is going to augment your understanding of the scriptures like nothing you've ever done before in your life. Am I exaggerating? No, this is very pro-Joseph Smith. Yeah. Okay. Enough of the shameless pitch. <coughs> we'll have some questions and answers later. Now to the presentation for the reason we're here today, tonight. Um, this, this is a case of life imitating art. Uh, if you've ever watched the movie or read the book uh, Da Vinci Code, you know that uh, uh, there's uh, the main character, the protagonist is uh, Robert Langford, I believe Langdon. is his name. Langdon. 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 Redford, yeah, that's another guy. <laughs> Thanks for the correction. Robert Langdon, in the beginning of the movie, he is standing before a large audience. I, I'd love to have an audience like that sometime. It's only happened once in my career, so uh, maybe it'll happen again. But um, he's speaking to a large audience about the meaning of symbolism, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And when we're finally through, you'll see that what the symbols we're going to see argue for ongoing revelation in the church. There is no other way these symbols could have found their way. Now, I don't know who was inspired, you know. Uh, uh, I believe it was President Hinckley was president at the time, and he certainly had to sign off on all this. We'll talk about it. Uh, and, and there's no question that the architects and the engineers had to all sign off on it. And I'll explain why that's important. But somewhere along the line, someone did some studying and they got some revelation about these things. There is no other way it could have happened. So I'll explain to you how that works. All right, we'll be using some slides here. Uh, I know some of you might have to strain to see this. I'm sorry we don't have a larger display, but they have no projector here. so. We'll have to do with this. If you want to see any of the detail, feel free to come up later and look at it. Uh, on the videotape, we'll be inserting the pictures so the people watching online. Fact is that uh, you can go back and watch online. Stephen will be posting it. Ryan will be putting the video, the stills into the video. So thanks to both of them for all of their work. So here we go. The conference center in Salt Lake. I have an admission to make to begin with. Um, some seven years ago, I had occasion to take a tour of the conference center. And the tour inclu included, the, uh, the guide said, you want to see the roof? And I said, well, I, uh, what's on the roof? <laughs> you know? I, I've been on the roof of tall buildings before. It's usually some uh, gravel, tar, something combination uh, to uh, keep the rain from percolating into the building. Um, I said, sure. 
And, and, and I expected to, to see a little narrow set of stairs going up to a entry onto the roof. And he ushered us into the elevator and took us up. And they have an elevator right here, if you've been there, and you exit the elevator onto the roof. Very unusual for any kind of a building, you know, unless the roof is part of a penthouse. And usually then the elevator opens into the penthouse and not the gardens that might be there. And, and yes, it's not unusual to have gardens on a roof, but it's not common either. I went up there and uh, uh, I, saw, I saw the symbolism of the fountain and the rest. Couldn't miss it. Every fountain is designed to replicate plasma images seen in the ancient skies. That's why water was always a feature in every ancient temple, whether it was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon or, or the Greek temple in uh, Athens. Um, and it's a reason the water feature is part of our temples today. I don't know if you ever noticed, but there's almost always a water feature. Uh, there certainly is in the conference center. And the, and the water feature is just a way to, to bring to mind, to recall, for those who know about it, the uh, plasma images that were seen in the heavens anciently. But there's much more here. Let me, uh, let's see, I don't know if I can advance this. There's a straight on picture of it, uh, in case you can't see. On the left hand side, there's a circular feature with a pyramidal set of stairs leading up to it, and the fountain is in the middle. On the right side are uh, three circles. The rest is just kind of grassy, um, bushy area. They don't do much with it. At least they haven't so far, except for these uh, bushes around here that line the very distinct feature. Um, the odd thing is that that symbol is basically invisible. Oh yeah, of course you can see it, but you can't see it from the street. And my admission is that I stood in the middle of it and I didn't see it. Because at ground level, it's hard to per perceive what you're actually looking at. It's like all the ancient symbols from the plains of Nazca to the Egyptian pyramids to Stonehenge, um, uh, um, Angkor Wat, any temple complex in antiquity is meant to duplicate on the ground what was seen in the heavens. The, the very thing that Christ says in his, in his prayer, um, uh, uh, I can't think of the exact words. Uh, come, let, that's the part you're looking for. Yeah. On, on earth as on, it is in that's heaven. That's it. On earth as it is in, is in heaven. As above so below. That's another way of saying the same thing. And most cultures say the same thing. And that's exactly what we see here. This wasn't meant for the casual person on the street to see. This, this was meant for somebody with some considerable understanding. And I'll explain that as we go along. This is stunning. Moreover, in all the iconography uh, of temple worship, LDS temple worship, in, in, in this dispensation, this is unique. It's very common, as we'll see. In fact, let me forward it. It's very common in other cultures. Let's see if I can forgive me for. Are you able to move that table up a little bit? I can if you'd like, yeah. It's not a bad idea. Does that help a little? Yeah, this will all be inserted in the video. That's why I say I suggest you, you want to see it better than you can see it here, watch the video. Um, this is an artist's representation of one of the many, many images seen in the heavens anciently. This is generated by uh, 
secular scholars, comparative mythologists, none of them Latter-day Saint, but it's based on their research of these <coughs> images that were seen in the ancient heavens. This is one of those other legs of the stool that I was telling you about. This is entirely outside the church. But you can immediately see the correspondence between this and the rooftop symbol. This symbol is not seen anywhere else in LDS iconography tradition, iconographical tradition. Anyway, let me say even the pyramids fit on where the the sun dog. Is. <coughs> I'll go into that in just oh, okay. a minute. Over on the left side of the building, you see this figure here. I'm going to be standing in somebody's way. These three circles. This from this one, there's a large. Uh, what would you call it, Stephen? It's a glass window. It's, it's but but there's something the suspended. Water it's, it's a water fountain and it's a sculpture. Yeah, I, I would call it Venus, but I don't well, know but, what the artist calls it. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, I don't know either. But but there's but, there's but there Saturn, the Mars, and Venus right there. And, and 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 to the normal eye, it means nothing. You know, they're they're, they're not air intake ducts. They're not air conditioning units. They're just architectural features, um, uh, landscaping <coughs> features, if you will, on the top of this building, which brings me to one, this very point. This, this is a huge, you, you notice how large this room is here? They have to build trusses into these rooms that are very strong in order to carry the weight of the roof and snow and anything else that'll fall out to span this great wide space. Now, let your mind go to the conference center for a minute and realize what a huge space that thing spans. They had to build trusses that were exceptionally strong for the building, but more so to support the massive weight of this stuff that they were going to put on the roof. And somebody had to explain why it was going to cost so much more to do that. That's right, isn't it, Steve? Construction costs money, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> it does. Stephen's a contractor, so I can, I can rib him about it. This is reminiscent of, and this is why it's significant to people who've studied this stuff, like myself. This is an illustration that Joseph Smith drew. Most Latter-day Saints know nothing about it. Yes? I was just going to mention back to your comment as far as the planning and so forth. It definitely had to be approved right up the line because that would have been extremely expensive and it just wouldn't have been thrown in yeah. happenstance. They don't, the right. church doesn't work like that. It, it doesn't construct. I've ever dealt with them, it, they're no. pretty tight. They're There's really nothing tight. fly by night about the way the church does building projects. It's all very well laid out, all very well <laughs> planned. Um, thanks for that, Steve. The, um, this picture was produced by a man named Philo Dibble, for whom we are indebted, to whom we are indebted, for um, uh, the, the context of many of Joseph Smith's revelations, because uh, he was, um, Philo was uh, Joseph Smith's bodyguard, one of several. Therefore, he spent a great deal of time with Joseph Smith, and Joseph Smith drew him this picture which he produced around the turn of the century. He migrated out here with the saints in, in the pioneer uh, trek, settled in Springville, and he would uh, tour the LDS congregations with these uh, relics that he had from the restoration. He had uh, uh, the amulet that Joseph Smith was wearing when he was assassinated. He had one of Joseph Smith's seer stones that Joseph had personally given to him, and he had this picture. And the brethren not only allowed it, they encouraged it. Because Philo Dibble conveyed information that a lot of Latter-day Saints had not heard or had not heard in great detail. And this is one of them. There, there's so many things unique about this picture. It would take me far more time than I've got in this presentation to talk about it. But the most unique feature, two features, is one of these planets are stacked. First, there's three of them. And then they're in a stacked configuration. That is, instead of orbiting like this, they moved in tandem 
around the sun. Uh, again, the scientists will say that's not possible. It's not gravitationally possible. Okay. I have two sources. I have the comparative mythologists who have done the research into ancient cultures and traditions, and that the picture they come up with is just this for an arrangement of three planets seen above the Earth, poised over Earth's North Pole. So Earth was the fourth planet in this arrangement. The other source, of course, is Joseph Smith himself. And he agrees entirely with these comparative mythologists. In fact, understanding what the comparative mythologists are talking about has allowed me and many others to understand what Joseph was talking about. Otherwise, there's no context for what Joseph says. You won't find this in your uh, gospel doctrine manual, so don't go looking. The this Old is, Testament manual does refer to Velesky. It, Velikovsky. Velikovsky. It does, but none of this. Yeah. One thing I would but, add is the electronic universe supports mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah, the electric uh, universe yeah, is the other. That's the supports that's the, that arrangement uh, and how it can happen. That's the uh, cutting edge science part of the three part leg that I was talking about. Uh, and more specifically, it's called plasma physics, but I won't go into that tonight. But let's see if we can do this without. You can just hit the arrow keys. Will it do it with an arrow key? Yeah, well, get rid of the menu first. Which menu? Oh, I can do it. No, the touchpad doesn't work on this anymore. Oh, no, you can't. No? Oh, I got it. Where's my mouse? Oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Sorry. It's this one right here. <coughs> in addition, when we overlay the arrangement of the pyramids in Egypt on the Giza Plateau, the great, three great pyramids, <coughs> they also line up the same way Joseph Smith's illustration does, and the same way these three circles on the top of the conference center do. And this is because this is because that was the align the, the these these it's, uh, pyramids are lined up exactly the way the belt of Orion is today, which is in our current heavens the only thing that duplicates that alignment of planets that was seen anciently. So those who lived after the flood immediately recognized the belt of Orion as the only arrangement of stars in the heavens that duplicated the ancient three stars that once stood above the earth. So it's this alignment becomes very important. Steve, you can back to final devil. Were those planets touching or was there any no. There was a space the between. Any, yeah. Any water, because we've been talking about fountains, was there any water involved? No, but what there was. Well, at one time. Um, Joseph Smith's illustration shows them, like, shows them quite close. He's just trying to teach a principle. First, he drew a line through them so that he could say they were stacked. Secondly, he drew what Philo Dibble and others, like Eliza R. Snow, uh, uh, concluded were narrow necks of land, barring the imagery from the Book of Mormon, of course, where the north and the south parts of the land they inhabited were joined by a narrow neck of land. And that's the only way they had of explaining this. What these are, in reality, are plasma extending between uh, the two planets. Which planets are you suggesting that um, they are Saturn, Venus, and Mars. Because I've seen that, <coughs> this is just another, because as I understand it, Joseph Smith thought it was the Earth and the city of Amy. Yeah, that, 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 that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, Philo Dibble, well, I won't go back to that. Philo Dibble and others placed their own interpretation on it. They all said the same thing. <laughs> But if you, if you just set that aside for a while and let Joseph Smith's illustration speak for itself, I should go back to it. 
so you can actually see it here. Those aren't things Joseph Smith actually said. Those are <laughs> memory interpretations. <laughs> Remember him saying, I'm going to die. I'm just asking. Sure. I don't have any, anything there, there, there are statements like that. Mm -hmm. The earth flying on, on its wings. The, the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the wings of the earth. They came up with all kinds of metaphors. <laughs> and and I, I wouldn't put it beyond Joseph to have tried to explain it to him in terms they could understand. But I don't think, I don't think he was, I think he was ill-equipped to talk about things in those days that we barely can understand today. When I talk about electrified plasma, you say, well, what in the world is that? Well, uh, these fluorescent lights are electrified plasma. It, 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 it glowed. In fact, it was uh, very bright. And one of the reasons the prophets say in the last days there will be no need for a sun will be illuminated by what, what, the power of God, or I've forgotten the terms that they use, but this is what they're talking about. If those planets were overhead like they were in the past, the sun wouldn't have illuminated like it did before. Entirely possible. I mean... Um, What's really likely is that uh, our solar system has been entirely reorganized. Uh, nothing approaching this is seen today. Uh, we're living in a gravity-only universe, whereas in the past there were tremendous electromagnetic fields that governed them. That's what kept them. It, you'll, if, if you happen to go to my class, you'll see a demonstration of a... Um, um, what's it called? Um, uh, oh, quantum locking. Sem yeah, quantum locking, but it's a it's a it's a superconductor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they take a small disk and they reduce the temperature to near zero, sub uh, near uh, absolute zero, two hundred and something minus degrees. Uh, and then they place it on a magnet, and the thing hovers over the magnet. And what, they, what most of them don't show is you can turn the magnets over, and it still hovers underneath the magnets. It's trapped. It can't move, whether it's above or below. And a similar phenomenon is responsible for this arrangement of planets in the heavens, actually. Just something, just, you know, this is cutting-edge science. Of course, astronomers don't agree with that. Let me move forward as quick as I can here. This is a little tough for somebody who's nearly blind. Did Maybe. Joseph Smith ever make a co comment of, about astronomy being a negative comment about astronomy itself? No, no. he was very interested in it. In fact, in fact he, he did something that most prophets do, and that is he used two words interchangeably. Abraham, in the book of Abraham, one minute he calls Kolob a star, the next time he calls it a planet. Joseph Smith's description of the facsimile, these are planets, these are stars. The words used interchangeably. Why? Because these things are what the ancients called stars. The word, Greek word for planet is planeta, which means wanderer and only came into use after the polar configuration the planets disappeared from the heavens so it is proper the these were planet sized objects but the traditional word for them was stars even even the word uh, kokao beam that joseph smith wrote it, he wrote it he he wrote it phonetically kokao beam b e a m uh, as though it had some light, like a beam of light. In, in, in Hebrew, it's pronounced kokab im. Kokab means star. Im is plural, putting an S on the end. Kokab im, the stars. So Joseph used the term properly. Okay, um, that covers that. So here's, here's a composite that... Uh, uh, Mark Pennell from Australia did. 
This, this is an overlay of the image, the artist's conception of what the heavens looked like, and you can see how nicely it conforms to this image. Someone who has studied this imagery, this is why I feel like Robert Langdon in the movie, you know, this, this is symbolism from the past, and it's absolutely arcane and obscure to us today. But it is the key to the language of the prophets. It's the key to understanding the symbolism. That's why Joseph Smith could read the Egyptian when he saw it, because he understood the use of the symbols. He knew the originals. Now here's the kicker. This symbol, whether in the form that we see it on the roof or, or in the form that we see in this overlay, appears nowhere else in LDS iconographic tradition. Nowhere else. There's a few similar ones, ones in the beehive house, but nothing this concrete. And yet it corresponds to this study and research of the ancient planetary arrangement that stood over the earth. And it was placed on the conference center when it was built in the last decade. How did they know? And, and plus, it's got the Philo Dibble illustration um, uh, sealed in cement, so to speak. And the, the water fountain shows it too. The water fountain, just like every other uh, water feature in temples. There's also, um, the ascension motif is very important in the planetary <laughs> configuration. They, the ancients saw this as the stairway to heaven. It looked like a conduit up which you could rise to reach heaven. Joseph Smith, according to, uh, oh, let's see if I'm going to read it. It's in the lessons. Um, Jacob's ladder? No. Well, that's another word for it. Jacob's ladder is typically circular. That's why we have the circular staircases in the temples. They are an authentic cosmological symbol. And they, like so many other cosmological symbols, are included in a lot, if not all, of our temples. <coughs> I've not visited them all, so I can't speak authoritatively about that. Uh, there, is, there is this uh, gradual incline. You could actually push somebody in a wheelchair up. It, it, it's, it has a bar across, it has a, the, the entrance to it is blocked but it zigzags across the front and you can actually end up on the roof by ascending this incline, zigzagging incline up to the roof. This was a common feature as we'll see here in just a moment. So let me, let me move forward. On but it's a ramp, correct? It's a ramp. Yeah, and it goes up where there's water, the water fountain, plasma, and then also the, just on, on the big one, the, it, there are three stairs on the big one where you have the circle and the triangle. There are three tiers to them. And they're with yeah. the trees that outline it. The, I mean, I've walked it uh, what, half what? a dozen times. I mean, oh. you, wouldn't, you don't know it's there. I mean, you do but from pictures, but you don't know physically. Well, what, what, what Stephen's alluding to is that integral in the image, there are other messages. Yeah. It's not just the symbol itself. There are other messages in the symbol. That, as just the way we do by juxtaposing symbols today. I'm trying to think of a good example, and it's not, nothing coming to mind. But um, when we write, we use several nouns in a sentence to build the sentence. We, need, we use nouns and verbs and things like that. The ancients didn't typically write. Certainly the man on the street didn't write. But what they could understand are the symbols. So if this symbol had one meaning and this symbol had another, Combining them elaborated both ideas and gave you a third meaning. In this case, in this symbol, there are at least five or six meanings within the symbol, and I'll discuss those in a minute. One of these, of course, is the source of the term that Christ used to apply to himself, alpha and omega. And we are taught that that means it's the beginning and the end, that means omega, of course, is the last symbol in the Greek alphabet. Alpha is the first symbol in the Greek alphabet. But Christ didn't speak Greek. That was not his tradition. I have no idea what he actually said, 
The Greeks that wrote it afterwards put it that way because they could understand it. Really what it is, omega is big O, to use a term from a tire dealership. <laughs> big O. And the alpha is the pyramidal shape. So when Christ said, I am alpha and omega, he was claiming to be the source of this ancient symbol that they all knew. It had far more meaning than we impute to it today. You see? And this is the point. If you don't understand the symbolism to which the um, metaphor refers, <coughs> then you don't get the full message. It's like when Christ was approached by his apostles and, and they said, what do you speak in parables for? Just tell them. He said, no, to some it's given to understand and others it isn't. Yes, Stephen. So I believe the Exodus was caused by this, which um, one well, of the images, very similar. Yeah, one of the images of the polar configuration is a bowl. And right after the Israelites were saved, a little while after Moses left them alone for a little bit, what did they worship? The bowl. Something well, they that were, was up they were, in the sky. You have to remember, they were more Egyptian than sure, sure. Israelite in those well, days. Well, I think there's multiple things to it, but. It's kind of complex and not something we can really, but you're exactly right. Anyway, I, I show this so that you can see the corresponding symbols as well as the overlay. There can be no question. Whoever designed this roof understood these symbols pretty well. Even the sides go towards it. The, can I ask a question? You sure can. Um, when Jesus uh, said, I am Alpha and Omega, it was in the New Testament. It was during his mortality. That's right. How did the people living you know, concurrently with him understand those symbols? They understood them just the way he intended them to understand. I'm, I, am al I am alpha. This is where all of our alphabet came from. All the letters in our alphabet came from combinations of these symbols that were seen in the heavens. How did they know, though? Because um, according to things that um, I remember from what you explained before, they, um, this was a configuration that had, is not now visible to the people of his day. So Correct. how is it such a powerful symbol to them when it is millennia in the past? One word, tradition. And there's images of it all over the place. Uh, Even uh, today's society, there are. Movies go a lot off of it too. <laughs> sacred tradition. Key is the word sacred. We do the same thing today. You say, oh, oh, where, how? When we go to the temple. Remember I said everything you see, do, hear, wear, and say in the temple goes to these traditions. We haven't the faintest idea what we're saying or doing in the temple. But we're following these, these traditions to the letter. We memorize it and we repeat it verbatim. Why? Because it is what? Sacred tradition. Plus the fact that these things were so impressive that without this symbolism there was no religion in ancient cultures. There was no culture. Everything they did was to remind them of the sacred time the high times in the heavens before the time of the flood. And I'm talking about not the prophets, but I'm talking about the pagan or Gentile world, whatever you want to call it. Everybody had the same traditions. They talked about it differently. I'll show you in just a minute. I think there's a lot of sayings we even have today, like turning a frown upside down, I believe is from this. Yeah. The evil eye. Yeah, or the, the single eye, or one that's in the scriptures, oh. the, the light that shines in darkness, those planets shined at night. Our whole Christmas tradition, the tree with the star of the angel on top, the old man that lives in the north and comes once a year from the North Pole to give good gifts to all the children, all that stuff is symbolism. It's a parable. 
We recognize it as that. The ancients understood this too, but it was every bit as important to them as our celebration of Christmas is to us. Naturally, it was overlaid with Christ's tradition. Even the story of Christ in the New Testament follows this symbolism. His birth and the mysterious magi and the star that leads him is all referencing this stuff. The Greeks added that to the Gospels so that the Gospel would appear authentic. They had to. Otherwise, it would have been rejected as a religion. It didn't honor, it didn't honor these sacred traditions. Before Christ could teach the higher teachings, he had to honor the sacred traditions. He had to say, I am Alpha and I am Omega. He's, he's giving him his bona fides, okay? These are my these are my certificates. This is who I am. Believe in me. Even the Book of Mormon says the planets in their regular form do witness of the Supreme Creator. Yeah. I'm so, on 30, 44. So this is, the, <laughs> this is the symbol that I want to focus on for just a minute. Just to show you where these things appear in ancient tradition. Um, I need my glasses here because I can't... Oh. This is called a quaternity. It is a basic symbol derived from that image that's on the roof of the conference center, the image that you just saw a minute ago. And it's found in cultures around the world. I have to make sure that there's... Even Carl Jung, the psychologist, recognized the universality of these things. They find that schizophrenics often draw these, what they call Mandela's, these four-part squares in a circle sort of arrangement. Schizophrenics draw it. Velikovsky, that originally wrote the book, was not just an MD and a great scholar, he was a psychoanalyst. And he said, all of these images are embedded in the human psyche, and it doesn't take much for them to emerge. Uh, I, I think that's partially true. I think it also is true that we come from a pre-existence where we've seen this done many times. We've seen all of this before, and it's all buried back there somewhere. I mean, we didn't forget when we came here. It's just like a hard drive with a segment of the disk that's un inaccessible. We can't recall it. But, but if, you, if the hard drive malfunctions a little bit, boom, out this information comes. This is why when the missionaries knock on doors and start preaching the gospel, People say, you know, uh, some people say that rings true. Why? Because they heard it before. We all recognize that concept in the gospel. The same applies to these symbols. And you talked about this. I'll show you some more of these symbols. This is Hindu. There's, uh, this is an Australian. It, you can't see it real well, but that's that circle with a cross in it. It's on the ground, just like Stonehenge. We see it in cultures, and of course, of course, it's been elaborated, and, and there are many variations because every culture developed a different approach to these things. The great bowl of heaven in the Hebrew and Egyptian tradition that Stephen referenced becomes the elephant in the Hindu tradition. But you have to see the original symbol to know how that can possibly happen. Anyway. Horus was also the sign about yeah. 4,000 B.C. Yeah. And rose in the east at the heat. An another example of that. Say that louder. It's okay. okay. Finish doing it. This is a Buddhist mandala. What are we doing? Same thing. And, 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 and again, it's these symbols. It's these symbols that we see in different cultures that, without the unifying uh, application of the original symbols, look to be very different things. But when we see the original symbols, like or the original arrangement, like Joseph Smith drew in his illustration, 
suddenly all this comes into focus. Of course, three nested planets are going to look like an eye in heaven. S simple stuff. The ancients weren't any smarter or any less intelligent than we are. The reason they were drawn to these bizarre symbols is because they had deep meaning to them. And the reason that we don't know that deep meaning is why we don't understand it when we see it in the gospel of Jesus Christ or the restored gospel of Joseph Smith. The one and the same. Let me... Uh, there's a cathedral ceiling. Again, you can see the cruciform figure. It is almost universal. I, I remember when I took uh, Book of Mormon Archaeology from uh, Paul Chessman at BYU years ago. He was just thrilled to find crosses in the Mayan tradition. To, in his mind, that meant that they had at one time some form of Christianity. No, it's because they all have a common tradition in these very kinds of symbols in the heavens. And I'll show you early, th this might be a bit of a shocker to some of you, so be ready for this. Early Christianity saw Christ in this very symbol. I think that's my next slide. If it isn't, it should be. Well, it isn't. There's another example of the mandala. Oh, uh, this is the fountain in front of the temple. Is it Brigham City? Yeah, the Brigham City Temple. The, the fountain itself, the, the very design of the mandala is integrated into the fountain. And the center fountain, and, and, and this wasn't my idea, somebody else posted it online and said the fountain is, is the center column and uh, the four corners of heaven are displayed and so forth. Um, let me get to, I, I build up to something and then I didn't show it to you. There it is. Can you see? Christ depicted within the circle with the square inside. Early Christians understood. They understood this. It was a great conversion tool. Just like the apostles using the symbolic language, the metaphors based in the symbolism, the illustrations were the same thing. If you didn't show Christ there, it, it was the same thing as him not saying, I'm Alpha and Omega. These are, this is early Christians saying, Here's Christ's bona fides. He is authentic. Here he is in the symbol of, of the great God of antiquity, the, the destroyer and, and the son of God, what all these terms that the ancients applied to a mere planet. But Christ had to depict himself in that way in order to appear authentic to these people. Yes. Just to add to that, I, I think there's a couple purposes to the book of Revelations. One, showing us that something's going to happen in the future. Another is tying a lot of traditions that the other cultures had to Christ. Showing, look, see this? This was Christ. Once you see it, you're exactly right, Stephen. Once you see it, when you read the book of Revelation, you see uh, the, the stories there, the fantastic images that John paints. You see the German, uh, the, uh, German the Egyptian tradition. You certainly see the Greek tradition. You see the Hebrew or Jewish tradition. And, and, and we wonder why he's telling all these strange and fabulous stories. Because he was talking to people from disparate cultures in the same document. He was writing to the Gentiles, right? He even plainly says that. This is to the seven churches, of you know? Asia. Huh? Seven churches of Asia. Of Asia. Modern Turkey, roughly. Um, and they were Gentiles. None of them were Jews. Well, there might have been some Jews uh, um, in the congregation. Hence, he used the Jewish tradition. Most people don't recognize it, but John in Revelations talks about Noah's flood. How many people have told you that? How many of you have seen that in the book of Revelations? He's talking about Noah's flood in one section. Anyway, that's in the list. Um, let me let me advance this. Well, that's the same picture of, uh, of Christ. You're going to have to struggle with this a little bit, Ryan, to follow the story. But you'll have the slides. And uh, and and uh, of course, if you have a cross in a circle, 
then you can extend the points of the circle and come up with a square. You see? Again, just complicating the imagery. Still authentic, but that's how the ancients did it. I feel like Robert Langdon up here. That's too small to see, but that's the same image in the wall of the Salt Lake Temple. It's a circle with a ring around it inside of a square. It's on the Salt Lake Temple and the Conference Center on the walkway. On the Salt Lake Temple. And it's what, a, and and it's a repeated, of what it's a a repeated circle Saturn. freeze. It, 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 all around the parapets, it's called the string course underneath the towers. The towers themselves, I, I think I've got that on here. The towers themselves are symbols. We think of them as simply standard operating procedure. Remember the alpha part of this symbol? If you distill it down, you get the pillar, the, the triangle, the pyramid, with a circle on top. So you get the keyhole. Yeah, kind of a keyhole, that's right. So, what is that? Same thing. Where did the design from the Salt Lake Temple come from? Even the spires echo this ancient cosmological tradition. This is Alpha. And there's the Omega on top of that. The Omega is on top. The same thing, the same thing with the Maya and the Aztec tradition. The Aztec calendar is just a form of the mandala, the four points of the compass. The same thing Joseph Smith says in the, his uh, explanation of the uh, hypocephalus, facsimile number two, the circle. All right. the, the, the four creatures that are upside down, he says, this represents the four corners of the earth. It also has the tongue sticking out, which is Mars. Right, you know. but I, I'm trying to make a point That's here about the... See, again, again, if there's a square in there, then if there's a cross in there, then there's a square. And, and of course, we can't build a building that looks like this. When we build a temple, any kind of a structure, we build a rectangle, right? So where's the chief cornerstone, according to Joseph Smith? South the southeast corner. The southeast corner, why? Most likely. Light. Let me tell you, this figure in the heavens, the thing we've been looking at, was the source of all light before our sun. There was no sun. <coughs> it was the original sun, the best sun. We know it today as the planet Saturn, but that, what we know today, is just a shadow of the planet that once dominated Earth's skies. So when we see the pictures, um, even in um, the in the Christian era, when they do all the colorful, I'm trying to think of the word, but they have the halos around um, both the figures of Christ and Mary. Do they ever show a halo around anyone who was not associated with a planetary? No, it's a, sim it's a symbol of deity. Okay? A, 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 a circle with a ring around it is actually two planets in alignment. <coughs> this one is larger than this one. They are nested. This planet in the middle, if it's in the case of antiquity, if it was Mars, is said to be wearing this planet as a crown. In this case, it's a circular crown. At one point, at one point, because Earth's perspective changed, the plasma between the two planets created an image like that. That's poor art, but can any of you tell me what that is? It's a bowling pin. It's a crown of pharaohs. Exactly. But the bowling pin is so much more fun. It's the pharaohs. This was called the white crown. Why white? Because it was plasma. This was Venus, this was Mars, and this was the planet. From an earthly perspective, that's what they saw. 
from from the side it was Mars and Venus with this with this plasma <coughs> between them like that but this is what it looked like from an earthly perspective I'm doing a video right now that goes through a bunch of those. It's going to be about a four-minute video. And, and it shows these images. And it relates it to Joseph. Anyway, I'm way over, so I need to move fast. The whole pyramid is shaped. This is the alpha with, with the temple on top, the, the, the planet on the top of this pyramidal shape was seen to be the city of God, or God himself by the ancients. Remember the uh, Babylonians built the tower to try to reach heaven? How come, how, oh, well. what made them think they could do that? First of all, the planets were very close, and second, they saw a physical stairway to heaven on which things were, appeared to ascend and descend up and down, and so they said, well, let's build a tower and go there. It didn't, it didn't move across the sky like all the stars do today. It remained stationary. So, so the early general authorities said, Joseph Smith taught us that there was this city that hovered near the earth in antiquity. And, and LDS scholars read that today and they say, what were they smoking? They were talking about this business. The ancients for a time knew that ascension was possible. Well, they, they watched. They, they watched at least one prophet do it. They thought it. Yeah, well, yeah. The, the whole idea of ascension comes from the fact. Who said that? I did. Yeah, the whole idea of ascension comes from the fact that they saw stuff moving up and down this plasma pillar, the stairway to heaven. And then they tried to interpret it the rest of their lives through the symbolism. Yeah. Right. Their lives and generations exactly. after them. This is uh, why the pyramid was used. That's why it's a sacred, it's an excellent form for a temple. You can build it in a pyramid. You can build it in a square. You can build it in a circle. You can build it, there are many forms, like, like the Native American kiva. Perfectly good way to build the temple. Uh, just depends on your cultural tradition. There's the Maya temple. It, not only is it stepped, which it, in various stages it looks stepped, here they actually put the stairways on the four cardinal points ascending to the citadel or the top of the pyramid. It all follows this sacred form, the very form that's on the roof of the conference center. Uh, if I remember right, plasma was snakes, and they have tradition that there's a snake that goes up and down the yeah, stairs. Yeah, uh, Quetzalcoatl was a very yeah. important part. Teotihuacan, the same thing. The base of this pyramid is identical to the base of the pyramid of Cheops on the on the uh, plateau. What's it called? Giza. 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 Thank you. I get too much going on. There. My hard disk isn't working. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I need to finish up here. So finally we get the <coughs> Babylonian ziggurat, which with the whole design of the thing was to have this ascension experience. The initiate started at the bottom, climbed one set of stairs, entered in through a gate. That's why Christ said, narrow is the gate and straight is the way. They all understood what he was talking about, see? It, but it has a rich symbolism behind it that Christians have no concept of. Okay. So I think I've touched on everything that I needed to touch on. Except to say, or maybe reiterate, this, this came into existence on the roof of a temple that, or of a conference center that's been built. When did it when was it actually open? 2011 or so? Yeah, yeah. 11? April 6, 2000. There's the and voice the, of the... The architect, Elie, uh, excuse me, Leland Gray, said it was a temple and it had a southeast cornerstone dedication mm -hmm. like the other ones. Doesn't surprise me. 
good information. Thanks, Barrow. I don't know if you want to talk about the Crescent before you Is that documented about. anywhere? Yeah, I, I interviewed him three times, and he designed more temples than any other um, architect. He was, was a, he was a non-member, and after two years, he was designing temples for President Hinckley and did about 40 very quickly. Um, his first one was Portland, but um, he, he has some really interesting things to say about this. <coughs> is, uh, but is, uh, I mean, I'm assuming you've interviewed him and have you documented uh -huh, that? Or that's is all written, taped, and typed. And okay. mm -hmm. Is that available for anybody to get to at any time? Or no. Is that something that you... <laughs> that's, that's, that's something that I've been trying to figure out. Val's going to be telling me a little bit about this after the meeting, I hope, because... Uh, he has some in one of his books, The Day Star. He's got at least excerpts from that. Um, L listen, uh, one of the, here's, people ask me sometimes, well, I've never heard the brethren talk about this. That means that you're off on a tangent. Well, it's simple, the reason the brethren don't talk about it, because you can imagine, we already get accused of being pagan devil worshipers because of the symbols on the walls of our temples. If, if, if we tried to explain this stuff to people outside the church, this isn't missionary conversion stuff. This, you don't use this to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, not today. It was great in John's day. John's revelation is a missionary tract. It's not, it's not meant to reveal stupendous, marvelous information about the future. You know, that's what I was taught all my growing up years. And I believe it does have some. Well, it has some because everybody in antiquity believed that it was going to end just the way he said, you know. So but but the but the bulk of it is is a missionary tract using the sacred tradition of the many cultures in the Middle East in their day, they were teaching Gentiles, so they used the Gentile sacred symbolism to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's evident when you get the right perspective because John rehearses all of this and he says, and, and, and this means Christ. You see? This symbol means Christ. This is Christ. That's Christ. These are the saints. This is the church. So what do, Anthony, what do you think the significance of this is? Is this a creation motif of father, mother, and Son, is it Christ centered? What, what is the point of it all? Well, it's Christ centered in the in the Alpha and Omega is a name that Christ applied to himself. And and this symbol is Alpha and Omega. And then when you add the crescent, I would I would say it's the son of man, because the crescent what, looks like what I was going to what I was going to say, and I've got to summarize because I'm way over. I thought I was going to get away with a short presentation. <laughs> the, what, what looks like a smiley face here, as Stephen referenced it in my poor art, was sunlight falling on the limb of the planet Saturn. At midnight, right? At midnight. And the reason I say that is because if you look at, if you look at these pictures, the crescent can appear in the bottom, it can appear in the side, it can appear on the top, or it can appear on this side. In fact, these are the four cardinal positions that the crescent appeared to in the ancient day. And it, and it rotated this way in the heavens. It was brightest here. And this was midnight. Now the reason I point all this out is that on that symbol, the um, creator, whoever he was, whoever designed that, placed a series, he, he places the mandala uh, symbol with the fountain in the middle and, and the circle around the outside. And he places the crescent using a series of small pyramids. Are there nine of yeah, them? Yeah, there's nine. Nine pyramids. And he positions that pyramid, that those pyramids like this. In other words, indicating the crescent in this period, the position. Now, if this is your timepiece in antiquity, and this is midnight, and this is mid 
day. And this is morning. And this is evening. <coughs> Understanding that the crescent rotates around, where would this be in the ancient time of day? Well, I think he puts it down a little more than that, but it's not quite at midnight. It's a little before midnight. It's almost the end. Lighten up on me. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is that saying about the day part this, de about this depicts? In ancient language now, okay? Almost the end. Eleven times. Thank you. <laughs> Anthony? Yes. There are four major midnight occurrences in the Old Testament. Number one, Passover. Right. Christ is the great deliverer. Uh, the bridegroom comes to get his bride at twelve at midnight. midnight. Mm -hmm. and midnight Peter, in antiquity, midnight was the most sacred time of day. Today we think it's part of witchcraft. It's part of a religion that we know today is Wiccan, which retains that particular... It's not evil. It's his sign for sure, because he's the great deliverer, and that's when he comes to deliver his people. Do you remember the atomic clock that they invented back in the I don't know, late 50s, early 60s, where they said that they, they put the hands of the clock approaching... I don't know if it was midday or midnight, our clocks, incidentally, are designed the same way. John John uses 24 elders, but he's using the 24-hour clock, just like the old military clock that we use today. He calls them 24 elders, you see. He's referring to the same symbolism, okay, around the circle. So our <coughs> clocks today, because we they, they didn't have a day and night. It never really got dark. At, at the day was the day was a 24-hour business, but but when Earth fell from heaven, as um, uh, Job says, Lord spreadeth the heavens out over the empty place, and the earth hangeth from nothing. Earth was no longer the footstool of God. There was no connection here. These planets all disappeared. <coughs> wandered away we got our day night cycle that we have now one thing I just want to add to and to so add. and so our, let me finish our clocks now reflect that we have two 12 hour periods so what year are you uh, suggesting that took place? the change huh? Peter said it happened at the flood second Peter three right? second Peter yeah the he rehearses the whole history of the earth. He starts with Adam and Eve, and he says, the heavens and the earth that existed then vanished. And we got a new heaven and a new earth after the flood. And we read that, and we think that's kind of a metaphor. No, 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 no. This was the heavens that they knew, the ones that we've seen in the symbolism that generated all of the symbolism of all ancient cultures. And everything you read in Genesis is a parable based on this imagery. The story of the Hebrews doesn't begin until Exodus. The rest of it is their, it's their mythology. But recall that mythology is history. Um, to add some credence to the planet giving light all the time, I personally believe the sign of the birth of Christ in mm -hmm. the new world was a planet and one thing that we're told about it is there is a day a night and a day with no darkness well that was uh, that was uh, the sign of his coming several years before right I'm pretty sure it was his birth well it was his birth but yeah. it was a sign of his coming that's what the people in the new oh, world okay. they figured they, the prophets told him he's gonna be born <coughs> and then he's gonna die and then he's gonna appear to you I mean, that's uh, uh, Samuel the Lamanite. Yeah. Okay. But on that, I think the destructions that happen at the death are caused by the planet. Too. Well, I'll give you this little insight to chew on. It's my belief when Christ was crucified, he timed his crucifixion to a very similar kind of event. It was a cosmological <laughs> event. 
That's why he said, look for the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in heavens. Christ had total control of the events in the week leading up to his crucifixion. He knew it was coming. He timed it. The reason Moses was able to lead the children out of Israel because he knew it was coming. He timed everything. The Lord was showing him what to do and when in order to save the people. The reason that um, uh, Elijah was able to call down fire out of heaven, he knew when to do it. He duped the priests of Baal into a, into a contest and he let them dance around because he knew. He sent his servant out and he says, you watch the horizon and tell me what you're seeing. And the servant keeps running back and forth and telling him. And then he comes back and he says, well, I saw this cloud come up out of the water like the, about the size of a man's hand. Elijah said, okay, now it's my turn. Because <laughs> he knew it was coming. Christ knew it was coming. If, if, if uh, Samuel Lamanite knew it, surely the Savior knew it. And the Book of Mormon is a much more accurate, thank God for the Book of Mormon, it's a much more accurate record of what happened to the world at that time than the New Testament is. Profane history has suppressed that information. We think it was a little earthquake and the sky got dark and it shook and it, the, the veil in the temple rent and that was it. Why do you think people flock to Christianity, Jews especially flock to Christianity immediately after the crucifixion? Why did the church grow so quickly? Because they knew this was a sign of the Son of Man. They understood. Christ laid it out for him. He even told it to Caiaphas, the, the lead uh, of the Sanhedrin at the time. You know, he, he's, or tell me, are you the Messiah? Well, you've said it. <laughs> Blasphemy. We know it's not a man. It's going to be a planet. They knew. They all knew. For Christ to take that notoriety, that authority on himself, couldn't possibly be the Son of God. The Son of God was this thing that appeared in the heavens. A planet delivered the people at the Exodus. A planet delivered Abraham and uh, Lot. A planet delivered all the prophets. All, all, the, all the prophets we revere were men who came out and said, Look out, folks, duck! And that includes Joseph Smith. Always called a prophet. God has always called a prophet. His, his primary concern is with the welfare of his children. Get ready. The whole heavens and the earth are going to change. Anyway. So we'll be returning to this configuration. <laughs> Very likely, uh, Latter-day Prophets, uh, I, I, uh, the John Taylor vision, when they go back to Jackson County and he says he says the land is swept clean it's a planetary catastrophe he does that quite nicely the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico gets up and rushes up the Mississippi River Valley like a freight train about the speed of a Boeing 747 so that's when the planets come back together so the water is sucked up with gravitation to the and the oceans return to the poles where they were before yeah. Noah's flood so as it, as it, what's that? <laughs> what did you say? Global warming. Global warming, yeah, that's right. Par excellence. The ocean's boil. That's with the fire. Anyway, as it, as, it, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of, what's the quote? In the last days. In the last know, days. Exactly. Ether says it also. We don't, we, we can't, and until we have this perspective, we can't appreciate what the prophets have been saying to us. There, there is such meaning, such richness in what the prophets speak, and we're missing it. 
So now, the folks that have taken the class, tell me, am I exaggerating? No. no. Thank you. you you'll see it all over the place. When yeah, you're yeah, just you doing become, your normal scripture study, not looking for it, you'll see it. You become sensitized to this because you've learned a, a corrected view of our history, not this fraud that's been foisted on us by modern astronomy. Mm -hmm. Val, you were going to say something. Oh, just your uh, impression for its significance again. Is it, is it the creation point at, uh, uh, when in first... Uh, book of Genesis then, this is the configuration of the planets at the creation. Is that your impression then? Yeah. And then we'll be returning to that. So when <clears throat> the Lord is talking about uh, on the fourth day, let there be light, was this the light before the sun and the moon? Because we don't have the sun and the moon created until the fourth day. No, the, sign, the, the light appears on the first day. <coughs> it says let there be light. That's it. The light appears on the first day. Then the sun, the moon, and the stars are created in the fourth day. It, it, here, here. Uh, so is this, that the light? Oh, go ahead. This is the stunner. Brigham Young had this illustrated on the wall of the garden room in the Salt Lake Temple. It looks like a tornado. But it is what was seen in the heavens at what, they, what the ancients termed to be the creation. It was, it was these three planets inside of this plasma. Earth, Earth and these, uh, th there were at least four planets, Earth being here, and perhaps more, somewhere between seven and nine, because this, the reason I can say that with some certainty is because this is precisely what the plasma physicists see in the laboratory in a plasma pinch, which is the figure in which all planets, suns, stars are created. It's, a, it's, it's an electrical current that runs through these and envelops these planets in this long, thin, stringy looking thing of light. So where's Jupiter? I mean, it's so it, huge compared it, to that. Uh, Well, Saturn would have been here and Jupiter would have been behind it somewhere. In fact, Jupiter was probably the anchor of the set of uh, groups. But there's no way to know this because from, from antiquity, in, in ancient's point of view, all they saw were three planets mm -hmm. until the time of Noah and after the time of Noah. In the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. This, this was the earth. It wasn't just our little parochial planet. It was this <laughs> congregation, like I said. Job says in his day, now after the flood, he says, the Lord stretcheth the heavens out over the empty place and the earth hangeth from nothing. Why is that so unusual? That describes the way we see this guy. But, but no, or Jonah, or Job was clearly surprised by that concept, or at least he used it as a device to explain that to people. <coughs> and, and this plasma column, to answer your question, from an earthly point of view, looked just like this. And they saw the dry land, the planets, emerge from the waters of heaven. The waters above and the waters below. <coughs> Meaning, it, it, your interpretation is that is north and south. <coughs> no, no. The, you're looking. The you're looking you're from looking the earth the up this perspective. You're looking just like looking down a gun barrel. You look down a gun barrel and you can see the spiraling. <coughs> uh, what, what do they call it? Rifling. rifling, thank you. You can see the rifling. When, when earthlings looked down the gun barrel, so to speak, because earth was at the bottom of the stack, when they looked up, up the riflings, they saw this swirling waters. Some cultures describe it as cotton, some as mud, some as water. Um, they got all kinds of terms, clouds. <coughs> you see? And, this, and, and again, this very, this, in, the, in the Salt Lake Temple, you see this very swirling pattern painted on the wall of the garden room. I think it's creation. creation. Oh, okay, so pardon me, creation room, thank you. I stand corrected. <coughs> so uh, how does this relate to Kolob? This is Kolob. Ah. So uh, those are coming back to the earth where many describe the earth going back to it, which could be the same thing. But it's a matter uh, of perspective. Mm -hmm. And the prophets have seen it. You, 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 
Um, in the early days of the church, the church magazine was called the Contributor. And there have been, there were two or three, maybe more, uh, stories that, without attribution, don't know who actually had them, but the general authorities were the editors. I think, uh, I think Brigham was the first editor. What, did he serve a mission in England? Brigham yeah, did, yeah. He did. And I think I think that's where he started the contributor. If I, if but memory that's after serves. Salt, they arrived in Salt Lake. Yeah. Right. Before it was the morning, morning and evening. Morning stars, and evening star. No, which is Venus. Well, yeah. But the but the point. Uh, yeah. The, the, you know, Joseph Smith surrounded himself with these symbolic references, and we just we we see them casually. We don't see them for what they're meant to be. What do you interpret the Jupiter talisman in his pocket to mean? Uh, Jupiter was was in the Greek tradition was the son of God who deposed Kronos, drove him off of the mountain. And Kronos was Saturn, correct? Kronos was Saturn. Great timepiece. Yeah, and Jupiter was Jupiter. So so the Jupiter talisman it just becomes a symbol of the son of God. In, in symbolic parlance. Is that simple? I mean, what, the symbol for Christ being born is often Venus associated with Jupiter, yeah. and yet Saturn is the big deal in this configuration, which is then referencing the Father, correct? Right. And then Venus, his mother, Christ's mother, yeah. and then Christ would be Mars, the red, the yeah. red planet, the marred one. Right. And the apple of the mother's eye and all that. Saturn sitting on the lap on Isis in Egypt. Right. Saturn, Venus, and Mars. And my friend over here, Ryan, is doing some dynamite animations. You'll see him in the next few months. He's been working for years, and he's created some gorgeous stuff. You've maybe seen some of it already on the Facebook page. Mars exited the center place and descended to the Earth. As he did so, he grew larger. This, is, this, was the, this was an excursion that happened during this arrangement of polar configuration. Thus, Venus becomes the mother from whose womb the son of God, Mars being the son of Venus, or Saturn, later supplanted by Jupiter, but it's just a confusion of terms. See, to me, that, that's the significance of all this, is father, mother, and son. Exactly. Not, the, not the things we tend to worship today. That's why I believe this is so important. Yeah. And then there's another thing I think that's just critical, and it's the cross shape. When you have that crescent underneath, it's the Savior on the cross. Exactly. And, and he's the deliverer, and that's the symbol of his deliverance. And he's coming again. To deliverance. So that's why the sign of the that's grand why that sign of the is on the roof. That's the, it. That's it. It's coming again. The, the more authentic pictures I see of the cross, mm -hmm. they have the tau mark, and which also when you go look at the plasma from Mars coming down gives you the full cross, but then also his arms are curved like the crescent. So and then they have the halo around. Mars there. descended to the earth, grew large, grew old, <coughs> diseased took the disease from the world and then returned to his mother womb, mother's womb, centered himself on Venus once again. It did return Mars. This, 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 this tradition applied to Christ was, I believe, done by the Greek saints because the Greeks are the one that wrote the Old Testament or the New Testament. It was not the apostles. We know that. So they adopted this, this tradition of the Immaculate Conception was just as old as mankind. Mars was born from Venus, hence Nicodemus ap approaches Christ and when Christ is talking about the, the new birth, being born again, and he asked a s seemingly stupid question, wait a minute, can a man enter his mother's womb and be born again? So Mars did return. Mars did. Mars not only returned once, he may have returned two or three times. Well, the Nephi says it in his vision, the condescension. Condescension. Down. Oh, 
say condescension. Condescension, and then ascension. Con con uh, condescension is something that one water one. does in the air. Yeah. Oh, Condensation, oops. I mean. <laughs> anyway, I'm oops. sorry, Steve. Well, I had to, the right idea. Trying to keep <laughs> you honest. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that is the condescension of God that He sent His Son <laughs> to the earth to save us. But that that being is, I mean, when we talk about that, we're talking about Jesus Christ. Right. That's and right. It, and when you talk about Egypt, you talk about Horus. It's not the same thing. No, Horus is There is, is so many. It's, uh, it's Osiris yeah. would be Christ. So and his son is Horus. Well, so who is to me the Davidic servant in the last days? I won't. I won't. I won't. Uh, Try, that, that's another you subject for another whole for lesson. You, you folks really take the ball and run with it, don't you? <laughs> so you, you, I mean, I'm here because I respect both of your words. I mean, I, I sure. is what I'm asking is, you, you believe that Horus is coming back as the Davidic servant? Yeah, I'm sorry, that, that has nothing sorry. to do with this. No, but, I understand, but, okay. But you have that uh, person you're, on the lab. But as you're, above, you're, you're, as using, a, you're using terms indiscriminately. They may mean something to you, sure. but in the ancient tradition, you've garbled it badly. Badly garbled. Okay. Take my lessons. I explain yeah. Horus. Even in Egypt. Well, I mean, so I, I, I can Horus. read about Horus. Tone. He is, he, he's Mars. He was Mars. Early history yeah. Egypt. They were better at And Osiris he, would be Saturn. Would be Saturn, his father. The, the, the Egyptians make that very clear in the funerary texts. It's Mars, the son, who opens the mouth of the deceased father. It just repeats, though, again. If there's a father, there's a son, and then there's another son, and another son. So it's right. just take and extend that. That's all, that's all I'm saying is there's a patriarchal order that repeats. Yeah. But there's a patriarchal order of the adversary as well that's identical to that. Right. And where does that, I mean, that's what I'm saying is I understand what's happened here, but that has to play. Somewhere in it, not it's not play, it's not played and discussed because that's very important. But mm -hmm. what I find is that people people apply the cosmic traditions to Satan as readily as they do to Christ. And John does exactly the same thing in Revelation. What was sacred and beautiful, the mother of the Son of God in the beginning of the book, then becomes the harlot, the and she she rides the red beast. Mars centered on Venus. The symbolism is clear. We try to, we try to impute something in our world into that, and it's just wrong. You can't do it. You've got to, you've got to see it the way the prophets meant it. John even or Peter even talks about it. In the last days, men are going to see things with a twisted perspective. You know, they're going to. They're going to deny the truth because they're teaching something entirely different. And we try to, the old, the old perspectives that, that I see, and this saddens me, I see Latter-day Saints adopting today because it's traditional Christian or, or based on traditional Christian is badly perverted. Give me an example. Oh. Blood moon. Yeah, blood moon is a blood recent. Blood. The blood moon business. Sure. That's a good one. That's a good one. He did create those, though, and they sure. are useful signs. But they're not. This is this is the, the they're, grand sign. They're not. The they're not. The, yeah, Joseph Smith said the last grand sign. There are several signs. They're all attached. I guess we can call this the question and answer because we're just about done with the second hour. This, it, you raise a good point, Ralph. The, these these catastrophic events last anywhere from. Uh, few weeks to a few months, usually four at the most. And the reason is because they're orbital. You're talking about, you're talk, if this is the sun, you're talking about the orbit of a planet, say that's Earth, and a, another planet that's on an elongated elliptical orbit that takes it way out. I don't mean I don't mean clear out to the edge of the solar system. I just mean out towards Saturn and Jupiter, which are quite a ways out. But the intersection, the, when the when the two, com most of the time when Earth com when it comes by, Earth's over here somewhere or here, and all it is is a nice light show. But as in the case of the Exodus, this planet.
comes by just as the earth is here, and the two of them practically meet up. They don't touch, just like that quantum trapping thing that I told you. They, they, the, the, the two planets get close together, and at a distance, they're drawn together. But as the distance closes, a new force emerges, which is the repulsive force. And when the repulsive and the attractive balance, the two planets are in locked position. And they line up north to south pole. And when that happens, Earth's inhabitants see the oceans get up out of their beds and migrate. They see the stars fall from the sky. Instead of moving in the directions they usually do, they turn and go in a completely different direction. Or if you're on the lit side of the world, you see the sun rise and make a circle before it continues on, like in the days of Joshua. You've done a wonderful job this Anthony. Have you, have you looked at the work of Gil Broussard? I haven't. Because he, he bases, uh, he's done a great job with Planet X coming, and he believes it's coming back next year. Yeah. And, uh, I'm and not a, I, I gotta tell you, uh -huh. I'm not a fan. I think the last day, sign of the last days is probably, I don't know, but it's more likely to be born of either the sun or one of the gaseous giants. Okay. It's not a known body. It's going to be new. Like Christ it. said, look, it's going to happen in a heartbeat. What's that one scripture in the DNC that he says, I've started my hand? Oh, yeah, you're talking about the 84th section. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, 84th section is about priesthood. And the Lord tells... We're really running out of time. We're going to have to finish up. No, well, just keep stuff. going. Yeah. They, haven't kicked us out. <laughs> they haven't kicked us out yet. Well, they will. Trust yeah, me. Yeah, around nine. You've still got the, time. The, 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 the Lord tells, through Joseph Smith, says to, uh, I think it was the bishop of the church at the time, says, I have a mission for you. And then he says, and the rest of you, brethren, have the same mission. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Not much of a scriptorian, I'm sorry. I don't want to disappoint anybody, but I'm not. And, and I tend to paraphrase the thing because, well, I mean, for obvious reasons. Um, and he says, what I want you to do is go to the great notable cities and warn them about the desolation of abomination that's about to befall them. Well, the desolation of abomination today, <coughs> oh, I, put my, I put my marker down. We would call a catastrophe, a planetary catastrophe. And he says, warn them of what's about to happen. You brethren, all you brethren, I want you to teach them clearly, which is what I'm doing for you tonight, and understandingly. long word, understandingly. Teach them clearly and understandingly. How many priesthood holders do you know that can teach clearly and understandingly what the desolation of abomination is? Practically none. And, and yet the Lord commanded us through Joseph Smith, priesthood holders, that is your responsibility. We can, we can know, not only can we not teach it, we can't even begin to articulate it. Most because don't we don't understand it, it. Most of them don't know what it is. And then, what the reference that Stephen's making, at the end, the Lord says, I have set my hand to change the starry heavens. There's the key. The change that brings about a new heaven and a new earth. He says, you can't see it yet, but with you, I am going to teach the world a lesson. And that's why you have to teach this desolation of abomination. We have abdicated that responsibility, brethren, due to our ignorance. Just I mean. Because we failed to learn what Joseph Smith 
Taurus. So was Venus born of that eye in Jupiter, that big red area? Yeah. Venus was, Venus, that's why the Israelites got away with claiming that they were the sons and daughters of God, because they had the blue eye. Venus was blue in color. Mars was dark red. He was the iris, or the, not the iris, the, uh, the center. Pupil. pupil, thank you. Mars is the pupil. That's why, that's why the Egyptians had an opening of the eye ritual. That's why they had an opening of the mouth. When, when, when Saturn, uh, Venus was centered on Saturn and Mars returned, the mouth was opened. Every Latter-day Saint who's gone through the temple should understand what that means. Because you've participated in that ritual every time you've gone. <coughs> yes? Um, in the, the Saturn myth, they would tell that kind of in the first section we meet um, Saturn with Adam. And I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on him being like the Osiris figure, Saturn, that were kind of locked yeah. together. He's just... He's just um, He's just using the symbolism to try to teach a lesson. He's creating a, a cosmic metaphor. Cosmic metaphor. Adam and Eve are Mars and Venus in the story. And the cherubim are the, are the left and the right hand side of the crescent as it rotates around. Just like the Egyptian goddesses that are stand on the left and the right of Pharaoh or on the left and right of Osiris with their arms extended. They're using their arms to create the crescent. You can create the crescent this way. You can create it this way. You can create it this way. And you can create it this way. Using the human form. And that's, and that's, why, that's why this was called the man of heaven. Put the crest on it. Well, it didn't have to have the crescent, just to have symbols. The man of heaven, calling himself Alpha and Omega, Christ was saying equivalently, I am the man of heaven. I am the son of God. And that's why uh, Caiaphas was so distraught that he rent his garment, blasphemy. You can't, you can't. Ten minutes? Thank you. Anyway. People, let me just tell you, I've, uh, I've ranged through a lot of stuff tonight, and uh, uh, some of it should have ring true, should have rung true. What's the good, what's the proper? I may write for a living, but <laughs> good night. Thank you. Thank you. I have, thank you. I'll just leave you with one parting thought. If you do anything else in the next year, learn this. If Joseph Smith taught it, if Christ taught it, if his apostles taught it, if the prophets from Adam on down or Joseph Smith taught it, don't you think it's worth a little investment of your time and effort to learn it? This will change your view of the gospel and it will strengthen your testimony and it will increase your desire to serve in the church and participate in the church because you'll realize this is the only institution on the face of the earth that retains these truths. It's the only place you can learn it. Just because average Latter-day Saint doesn't know it doesn't mean it isn't in our tradition. It is. It's in our temples. It's in our scriptures. Ancient and modern revelation. You can't know the gospel of Jesus Christ until you know this. It's not a sacrament meeting, so I'm not going <laughs> to. 
Well, thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Sharing. Thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah, thanks a lot. We have to stack these chairs. What do we have to do with them? I, I don't know what we have to do with the chairs. You know how to turn that off? I think you said just push it. Stephen dashed out of here, so I suspect something's going on. Can you see if he gets that, Matt? Are you going to see him? Well, he said you guys might be going to eat. Well, yeah, he said he'd join us after, but I think something's happened that he had to rush out. Oh, he just had to pick up his wife. He said he'd be back to meet.